I never thought I'd be starting over at 35, but here I am, Dr. Tessa Thompson, dentist and soon-to-be business owner. It's been three years since I married Mike, a mechanical engineer, five years my senior. We live in my apartment, he says he left his to his ex-wife after their divorce. I don't know much about that part of his life, and I've never pushed. Our life together has been good, for the most part. I make a comfortable living as a dentist, but I've always dreamed of more. That's why I've been squirreling away every extra penny, denying myself little luxuries. My goal? Opening my own private practice. You should do it, Tessa, Mike said one evening as we sat on our worn couch, the TV droning in the background. You'd be great at running your own business. I looked at him, surprised by his enthusiasm. You really think so? He nodded, taking a swig of his beer. Absolutely. My wife, the business owner. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? I couldn't help but smile. It did sound nice. It'll be a lot of work, I warned him. And money. We'll have to tighten our belts for a while. Mike waved his hand dismissively. Don't worry about that. We'll make it work. I'll support us for the first year while you get things up and running. You just focus on making your dream come true. His words filled me with warmth. This was why I loved him, his unwavering support, his belief in me. Okay, I said, my mind already racing with plans. Let's do this. The next few months were a whirlwind. I quit my job at the clinic, throwing myself headfirst into preparations. There was so much to do, getting licenses, finding the right location, renovations, equipment. Every day brought new challenges, new decisions to make. Finally, after what felt like a lifetime of preparation, my office was ready. I stood in the doorway, taking in the gleaming equipment, the fresh paint smell, the neatly arranged waiting area. This was mine. All mine. As I locked up that first night, a mix of excitement and terror churned in my stomach. Tomorrow, I'd open my doors to my first patients. I was on my own now, sink or swim. The first few months of running my own dental practice were a whirlwind. I worked seven days a week, from dawn till dusk, barely stopping to eat or sleep. My office became my second home, scratch that, my first home. I saw more of my dental chair than I did of my own bed. Dr. Thompson, your next patient is ready, my receptionist, Lisa, would say, poking her head into my office. I'd nod, gulping down the last of my cold coffee. Thanks, Lisa. Send them in. And so it went, day after day. Fillings, crowns, root canals, I did it all. When I wasn't with patients, I was buried in paperwork, learning the ins and outs of running a business. It was exhausting, but exhilarating too. This was my dream, after all. Mike and I became like ships passing in the night. When I left for work, he was still asleep. When I got home, he was already in bed. We communicated through hastily scribbled notes and brief text messages. How's work? I texted one day, during a rare quiet moment. Fine, came the reply, hours later. I frowned at my phone. That was it? Just fine? But before I could dwell on it, Lisa was calling me for another patient, and thoughts of Mike were pushed to the back of my mind. Weeks turned into months. I was so focused on my practice that I barely noticed the changing seasons. Spring became summer, summer faded into fall. I was making progress, slowly but surely. My patient list was growing, and I was starting to see some regulars. You're doing great, Dr. Thompson, Mr. Johnson, one of my first patients, said during a checkup. This place is really coming along. I beamed at him. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. That means a lot. But for every high, there was a low. The stress was constant, the pressure immense. There were nights I'd come home and cry, wondering if I'd made a terrible mistake. But then I'd think of how far I'd come, how much I'd invested, and I'd pull myself together. I couldn't give up now. One particularly grueling day, I stumbled home well past midnight. The apartment was dark and quiet. 
I kicked off my shoes and collapsed onto the couch, too tired to make it to the bedroom. That's when my phone rang. I groaned, fumbling for it in the dark. Who could be calling at this hour? Tessa, is that you? It was Mike's mother, Ellen, her voice tight with worry. I sat up, suddenly alert. Yes, it's me. What's wrong? I've been trying to reach Mike all day, Ellen said. He's not answering his phone. I'm worried sick. There's been some kind of scandal at his work. My heart dropped. Scandal? What scandal? I'm sorry, I don't know anything about this, I said, my mind racing. I haven't really talked to Mike in, well, in a while. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Oh, Mike's mother said, her voice small. I see. Well, if you hear from him, please ask him to call me. Of course, I promised. I'll talk to him as soon as I can. After we hung up, I sat in the dark, my exhaustion forgotten. What was going on with Mike? How could there be a scandal at his work that I knew nothing about? I found Mike in our bedroom, sitting on the edge of the bed with his head in his hands. He looked up when I entered, his eyes red-rimmed and tired. We need to talk, I said, my voice sounding strangely calm, despite the turmoil inside me. Your mom called. She said there was some kind of scandal at your work. What's going on, Mike? He let out a long, shaky breath. I quit my job, Tessa. About a month ago. The words hit me like a physical blow. A month? You've been unemployed for a month and you didn't tell me? I didn't want to upset you, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. You've been so busy with the practice, I didn't want to add to your stress. I stood up, pacing the room as I tried to process this information. So what happened? Your mom mentioned a scandal. Mike ran a hand through his hair, a gesture I'd seen a thousand times when he was uncomfortable. I had a fight with my boss. He was being unreasonable, demanding more and more overtime without compensation. I stood up to him, things got heated, and I walked out. My pride wouldn't let me stay. I wanted to yell, to shake him, to demand why he thought his pride was more important than our financial stability. But looking at him, slumped and defeated, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Instead, I sat back down beside him. What are you going to do now? I asked softly. Mike shrugged. I don't know. I think, I think I might be suffering from burnout. I've been thinking about seeing a psychologist, maybe taking a short break from work to figure things out. Part of me wanted to scream that we couldn't afford a break, that I was already working myself to the bone trying to keep my new practice afloat. But I swallowed those words. Mike needed support, not criticism. Okay, I said, taking his hand. If that's what you need, we'll make it work. But Mike, you have to promise me something. No more secrets. I need to know what's going on in your life, good or bad. Okay? Mike nodded, squeezing my hand. Okay, I promise. I'm sorry, Tessa. I should have told you sooner. The next day, I called the clinic where I used to work and asked if they had any part-time positions available. It was a step backward, but we needed the extra income. As I hung up the phone, having secured the part-time position, I looked at Mike. He was on the couch, staring blankly at the TV. I got the job, I said. I start next week. He just nodded in response, as if it was something that was taken for granted. The next few months were a blur of exhaustion and stress. I'd wake up at dawn, see patients at my office until early afternoon, then rush to the clinic for my part-time shift. By the time I got home each night, I was dead on my feet. Mike, true to his word, started seeing a psychologist. He talked about burnout and needing time to recuperate. I tried to be supportive, but it was hard not to feel resentful as I watched him lounging on the couch while I worked myself to the bone. One evening, about three months after Mike had quit his job, I came home to find him in an unusually good mood. Tessa, he exclaimed as I trudged through the door. I've got great news. I got a job. 
It's with that engineering firm downtown. I start next week. Relief washed over me. Finally, things were looking up. That's wonderful, Mike, I said, managing a tired smile. We should celebrate. And celebrate we did. I splurged on a bottle of wine, and for the first time in months, we sat down to a meal together, talking and laughing like we used to. It felt good, like maybe we were getting back on track. But my relief was short-lived. A month into his new job, Mike came home fuming. I quit, he announced, throwing his briefcase onto the couch. I froze, the plate I was washing slipping from my hands and clattering into the sink. What? Why? The boss is a tyrant, Mike spat. He wants complete control over everything. I'm not some puppet he can order around. So what now? I asked when he finally paused for breath. He shrugged. I'll find something else. Something better. A job where they appreciate my skills and give me the freedom I deserve. I wanted to scream. To shake him and ask if he appreciated my skills, if he understood the freedom I'd given up to keep us afloat. But I didn't. I just nodded, turned back to the dishes, and tried to ignore the sinking feeling in my stomach. The weeks that followed were tense. Mike spent his days at home, supposedly job hunting, while I continued my grueling schedule. But more and more often, I'd come home to find him playing video games or watching TV. Any luck with the job search? I'd ask. Nothing suitable yet, he'd reply, not looking away from the screen. These companies just don't get it. I need something challenging, you know? With good pay and flexible hours. Then one day, Mike started talking about having children. Wouldn't it be great to have a little one running around, he said over breakfast. I could stay home and take care of the kid while you work. It's the perfect solution. I stared at him, my coffee mug frozen halfway to my lips. Mike, we can barely afford our current lifestyle. How could we possibly support a child? He waved his hand dismissively. We'll figure it out. You're doing great with your practice, and I'll find something eventually. Come on, Tessa, don't you want to be a mom? The question hit me like a punch to the gut. Of course I wanted children, someday. But not like this. Not when our marriage was hanging by a thread and our financial situation was so precarious. I think we need to focus on getting our lives in order first, I said carefully. Maybe when things are more stable. Mike's face fell. You just don't understand, he muttered. You're always so focused on work, you can't see what's really important. His words stung, but I didn't have the energy to argue. I just got up, rinsed my mug, and headed out to another long day of work. As the months dragged on, the tension in our household grew thicker. Mike's job search had become sporadic at best, and he spent more and more time immersed in his video games. I was exhausted, stressed, and increasingly resentful. One evening, I came home to find Mike excitedly setting up a new gaming console. What's this? I asked, my voice tight. He grinned, not noticing my tone. Just got the latest system. The graphics are incredible. I felt my temper flare. And how exactly did you pay for this? Mike's smile faltered. I, uh, took some money from our joint account. But don't worry, it's an investment in my hobby. Once I start working again, I'll pay it all back. The argument that followed was ugly. Months of pent-up frustration and resentment came pouring out. We said things we couldn't take back, reopened old wounds, and created new ones. From that day on, I stopped putting money into our joint account. I paid the bills myself and bought groceries as needed. Mike was furious, accusing me of not respecting him and infringing on his rights. I'm the man of this house, he yelled during one particularly heated argument. I should be managing our finances. I laughed bitterly. What finances, Mike? The money I earned that you spend on games and beer? The atmosphere at home became unbearable. We barely spoke and when we did, it usually ended in an argument. I threw myself into my work even more, using it as an escape from the disaster my personal life had become. 
then came the day that changed everything. I was at home, catching up on some paperwork, when I overheard Mike on the phone with his parents. His voice drifted from the bedroom, animated in a way I hadn't heard in months. Yeah, I need a new business suit for this job interview, he was saying. It's a great opportunity, but I'm a little short on cash right now. Could you maybe help me out? I felt a spark of hope. Was Mike finally taking his job search seriously? But as I listened, that hope quickly turned to ash. Thanks, Mom. I really appreciate it. I'll pay you back as soon as I get the job. The call ended, and I waited, expecting Mike to come share the news about his interview. But he didn't. Instead, I heard the familiar sounds of him booting up his computer. Curious and increasingly suspicious, I quietly made my way to the bedroom door. What I saw made my blood run cold. Mike was online, not browsing job listings, but purchasing a new computer game and ordering a case of beer for delivery. I couldn't believe my eyes. He had just lied to his parents, begged them for money under false pretenses, and now he was spending it on alcohol and games? What the hell do you think you're doing? I demanded, pushing the door open. Mike jumped, guilt flashing across his face, before quickly being replaced by defiance. It's none of your business. This is my money. Your money? I was incredulous. You just lied to your parents to get that money. They think you're buying a suit for a job interview. The argument that followed was the worst we'd ever had. Finally, red-faced and shaking with anger, Mike grabbed a bag and started throwing clothes into it. Where are you going? I asked, my voice hoarse from yelling. To my parents, he spat. At least they support me. As the door slammed behind him, I sank to the floor, overwhelmed by a mix of anger, disappointment, and an odd sense of relief. For the first time in months, maybe years, I felt like I could breathe. Days passed since Mike stormed out, and the apartment felt eerily quiet without him. On the fourth day, as I was finishing up with a patient, my phone buzzed. Mike's name flashed on the screen. My heart raced as I answered. Hey, Tessa. Mike's voice was cheerful, as if nothing had happened. I'm in Miami with my parents. Mom's always wanted to come here, so we decided to make a weekend of it. I took a deep breath, trying to keep my voice steady. And how exactly are you paying for this trip? There was a brief pause before Mike answered, his tone slightly less jovial. Well, I had to borrow a couple of your credit cards. But don't worry. I'll pay you back many times over once I start this new job. I felt sick. You took my credit cards without asking me? Come on, don't be like that, Mike said, his voice taking on that wheedling tone I'd grown to hate. It's just for the weekend. I'll bring you back a nice shell from the beach, okay? Have a good weekend, honey. Before I could respond, he had hung up. In that moment, something inside me snapped. With shaking hands, I opened my banking app and blocked all my credit cards. Next, I called a locksmith. Within an hour, he was at my apartment, changing the locks. My final stop that day was a lawyer's office. I'd found her online, Sandra Patel, specializing in divorce law. I want to file for divorce, I said, the words coming out easier than I'd expected. Sandra nodded, her expression compassionate but professional. I understand, Dr. Thompson. We'll start the process right away. Can you tell me a bit more about your situation? By the time I left her office, the divorce papers were being drawn up. As I stepped out onto the street, the late afternoon sun warming my face, I felt something I hadn't experienced in a long time, hope. The sun had long set when my phone rang again. Mike's name flashed on the screen, and I braced myself as I answered. Tessa? Thank God you picked up. Mike's voice was frantic. Something's wrong with the credit cards. They're not working, and we can't pay for anything here. Mom and Dad are freaking out. I took a deep breath, stealing myself. That's because I blocked them, Mike. I didn't give you permission to use my cards. There was stunned silence for a moment before Mike spoke again. Look, I'm sorry, okay? His tone shifted to pleading. 
we're already here on the coast. Can't you just unblock the cards? We'll sort everything out when we get back, I promise. I almost laughed at the familiarity of those empty promises. No, Mike. I'm done sorting things out for you. You've put me in impossible situations, time and time again. Now you can figure this one out on your own. Tessa, please. He was begging now. You're putting me in such an awkward position. My parents are here, we have no way to pay, this is your problem too. No, Mike, I said firmly. This is your problem. You created it, now you solve it. Goodbye. The next day, I took a personal day from work. I spent the morning packing up Mike's belongings, trying not to get caught up in memories as I boxed up his clothes, books, and the various gadgets he'd accumulated over the years. Once everything was packed, I called a storage facility and arranged for his things to be kept there. A few days later, I was at work when my phone buzzed with a call from Mike. I stepped out of my office to take it. Tessa? I'm outside the apartment, but my key isn't working. Did you change the locks? He sounded incredulous. Yes, I did, I replied calmly. Mike, I've sent divorce papers to your parents' address. You should be receiving them soon. There was a sharp intake of breath on the other end of the line. Divorce papers? Tessa, you can't be serious. We can work this out, we always do. Not this time, I said, surprised at how steady my voice was. I packed up your things and sent them to a storage facility. I'll text you the details. Tessa, please, he begged. Let's start over. I'll change, I promise. Just give me one more chance. I closed my eyes, memories of all the last chances flashing through my mind. No, Mike. It's over. I hope you find what you're looking for, but it won't be with me. As I hung up the phone, I felt a mix of emotions, sadness for the end of what we once had, relief that it was finally over, and a growing excitement for what the future might hold. For the first time in years, that future was entirely up to me. A few weeks after I'd sent Mike's belongings to storage, my phone rang with an unfamiliar number. I answered cautiously. Tessa? It's Ellen, Mike's mother. I braced myself, expecting a tirade about ruining their Miami trip. But Ellen's voice was soft, almost apologetic. I owe you an apology, Tessa, she said, catching me off guard. I had no idea what Mike has been putting you through. As Ellen spoke, the pieces of Mike's past began to fall into place. She told me about Mike's first wife, how she'd left him due to his chronic irresponsibility, Ellen had hoped Mike had changed, that our marriage would be different. When we got back from Miami and I learned the truth, how he'd been lying to you, stealing your money, I was devastated, Ellen confessed. I kicked him out of the house. I couldn't enable his behavior anymore. I felt a wave of empathy for this woman who'd raised Mike, who'd hoped for the best for her son. It's not your fault, Ellen, I said softly. You didn't know. Still, I'm so sorry for what he's put you through, she replied. You didn't deserve any of it. After we hung up, I sat in silence, processing the conversation. It was oddly comforting to know that I wasn't alone in being disappointed by Mike. In the weeks that followed, Mike made several attempts to reconcile. He showed up at my office, flowers in hand, pleading for another chance. He waited outside our, my apartment, trying to catch me as I came home. Each time, I refused to engage. I knew now that he wouldn't change, that we'd end up in the same cycle if I let him back in. As time passed, I found myself settling into a new rhythm. Without Mike's expenses draining our accounts, I was able to focus fully on my practice. I left the part-time clinic job, pouring all my energy into my own office. I hired a marketing consultant, and soon my patient list was growing steadily. Six months after filing for divorce, I hired two more dentists to help with the increased workload. It was a joy to see my little practice flourishing, to know that all my hard work was finally paying off. A year after Mike left, I made the final payment on my business loan. To celebrate, I booked a weekend trip to a nearby spa resort. 
something I'd always wanted to do but had never allowed myself to splurge on before. As I lounged by the pool, sipping a fruity cocktail, I marveled at how much my life had changed. Now, as I sit in my expanded office, looking over plans for a new wing to accommodate more specialists, I can't help but feel proud of how far I've come. The past two years have been a journey of self-discovery and growth. I've learned to value myself, to trust my instincts, and to never settle for less than I deserve. Who knows what the future might bring? For now, I'm content knowing that whatever comes next, I have the strength and wisdom to handle it. My story isn't over, in many ways, it feels like it's just beginning, 